Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to our church online. And we want to thank you for taking your time to listen to the word of God. For it revives our spirit. And after hearing the word of God, I know that our lives will never be the same. May God bless you as you are listening to the word of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for the life that you have given us. We thank you for everything that you have given us. We thank you especially for the gift of life. That we are alive even in these very uncertain times. We see the hand of God doing great things in our lives. So Father, we want to thank you for the gift of life. We thank you that we are here because of you. We thank you that we are able to listen to the word of God. We thank you that we are able to hear what God is saying to us within the, especially talking to the spirit within us. Thank you, Father, that your word, it is only your word that can speak us the language that we can hear the language that we can handle. Thank you, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. What an awesome time to be praising God. Um, I believe that when we listen to the Word of God, we're praising Him. When we read the Word of God, we're praising Him. Um, the, the Bible verse I'll be reading today is from Hebrews 4. 12 to 16 and just before this verse it says today if you hear his voice do not harden your hearts and I believe that uh, when we hear the word of God we're, uh, we're actually hearing his voice so do not harden your hearts today for the word of God is alive and active sharper than any double edged sword it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him who we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we, have not, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathise with our weakness but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are yet he did not sin let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need praise the Lord what an awesome verse that uh Jesus has experienced what we all experienced and, and empathises with us. It's just relatable. He, he relates with us. So, yeah, as we um, get Johnson to come back up, bring open ears, he's going to bring an awesome message as he always does. I uh, encourage you to go back through other messages and check out previous weeks. If you've missed one, check it out. If you've liked one before, uh, watch it again because we always get something new and extra from any message we hear from the Lord. So God bless, Brother Johnson. Morning once again, and uh, I want to uh, share with you on the theme, the power of God's word, not natural effects. The power of God's word, not natural effects. I want you to listen to this description of a book. And if you see, you can guess which book is described. This book contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy and its precepts are binding. Its histories are true and its decisions are multitude, immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is a traveler's map, 
the pilgrim's shelf, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here is paradise restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is grand object, our, our good is design, and the glory of God is end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It is given you in life, will be opened in judgment, and be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, will reward the great labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. There is only one book in all of the world that fits that description. It is the book that I hold in my hand, known all over the world. And this is the book. It is the Bible. It is the Bible. It is the Bible. Various metaphors have been used to describe the Bible in the Bible. The Lord Jesus said the Bible is like a seed that grows. The prophet Isaiah said the Bible is like a hammer that breaks and a fire that burns. But here we are told the Bible is like a sword that cuts in Ephesians 6 verse 17. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This book is a sword, the sword of the Lord. The text before us tells us about the wonder and the wisdom and the work of this, the greatest of all books. We are told in uncertain terms what the Bible is, what the Bible does, and why the Bible is unlike any other book that has ever been written. It is divine in its origin. Just what is this book called the Bible? The term that is used for it in Hebrews 4, verse 12, it is the word of God. Even though this book was penned by 40 different writers who wrote 66 different books over a period of 1,600 years, it has only one author. And the author is God. Nowhere does the Bible ever claim to be the words of men. It claims to be the word of God. Someone once said, made this astute observation about the Bible. He says, I know men did not write this book. I know men did not write this book. Why? A good man would not have written it because it claimed to be from God. And a good man would not make a false claim. <laughs> a bad man would not have written this book because it condemns his own evil. So it must be written by God. So this is the book I'm talking about. Over 300 times you'll find in the Bible these phrases, the word of God, the word of the Lord. In the Old Testament alone, phrases like God said, God spoke, and the word of the Lord came all over. Okay, nearly 4,000 times, 700 times in the five, first five books, 40 times in one chapter. So this phrase, the word of God, is God's favorite term for this book. When the Bible speaks, God speaks. So God's favorite term is the liberal, smarted, hated term. So the liberal despises that phrase, the word of God. The liberal says the Bible contains the word of God. Or it functions as the word of God. Or it becomes the word of God in our existential experience. So, well, there is only one thing wrong with all of those statements. They are wrong. The Bible does not just contain the word of God. Or functions as the word of God. Or become the word of God. It is the word of God. It is the word of God. You can't change it to be something else. It is the word of God. It is the word of God. So now, because the Bible is the word of God, it is inspired. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says... All scripture is given by God's inspiration. Is given by inspiration of God. Now if the Bible is inspired, it must be inerrant. 
For God never inspired error. If the Bible is inerrant, then it must be infallible. For God never lies or makes a mistake. Because God never changes. His word never changes, therefore it must be immutable. There is only one book that could meet all of four of these criteria. And that is the word of God. Because it is inspired, it is a true book. Because it is inerrant and infallible, it is just with book. Because, because it is immutable, it is a timeless book. This is the book that was authored by God, the Father, and approved by Jesus Christ, the Son, and activated by God, the Holy Spirit. That is the book we are talking about. It is dynamic in its operation. Because it is the word of God, this book possesses two characteristics. If you would expect God from God's word, it is alive. That is what Hebrews is saying. It is alive. It is alive in its saying. And you find that the word of God is alive. Let, let, let me just uh, reread the same verse uh, from Hebrews 4. Let me reread it. So that we would hear that the Bible is really alive. It's alive in its dealings. Verse 4. For the word of God is living and active. Living and active. Sharper than any double-edged sword. It is penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. You can see, it is alive. So the word of God is living. It's not something that is dead. dead. It's living. So the Greek word for living is the word that gives us our word zoology. This book gives life. It gives life. If you cut it, it will bleed the blood of Jesus. If you listen to it, it will tell you supernatural truth beyond of all the sages of all the ages. If, if you believe it, it will fuel your soul with joy, your spirit with life, your mind with truth, and your heart with wisdom. No other book ever written as life. No other book ever written gives life. The Lord Jesus said in John 6, verse 63, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. That is what he says. So the Bible is a living book because it is about the living Lord. Open this book and the Lord Jesus will step right off the pages into heart. And he will walk with you and talk with you and tell you that you are his own. On daily basis. So God breathed into man. And man became a living soul. God breathed into this book. And this book became a living book. So the Greek word for inspired. Literally means breathed out. So the same breath. That gave life to man. Is the same breath that gives life to this book. God is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. He is the living God, and of God gives living words. I always say, if your God is dead, try mine. Mine is living. He's alive. So the participle of living is in the present tense, which denotes continuous action. In other words, literally translated, it says, the word of God is continuously and always living. That means you cannot kill it. Through the centuries, the enemies of God have tried to kill the Bible. And at times they thought they had buried the Bible. But this corpse is a habit of coming back to life. And what does it do? Outliving its poor bearers. Those who thought they've killed it, they all have died. And the Bible is still there. It, it is there. It is active. So the word of God is all powerful. It's all powerful. The Greek word energize gives us our English word energy. It is a way that literally means active, that produces results. Energy that produces results. It actually comes from two Greek words. The word en, which means et, and the word ego, which means work. So together, it literally means at work. 
So the word of God is at work and it works. And it will work. It will continue to do that. So the power of this book is almost indescribable, yet it is also undeniable. Think for just a moment of how powerful, energizing and activating God's word is. There was a time when there was no universe. Then God spoke his word. Let there be light, and it was there. Let there be trees, and it was there. So then God spoke his word, and instantaneously stars began to twinkle. Suns began to shine. The waves began to roll. Planets began to spin on the axis and rotate on their orbits. Or consider the miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ. All he had to do was speak the word, and disease were cured. Storms quietened down and went to sleep like little babies. Dead men came back to life. The power of this book is absolutely awesome. Razalus, wake up! Just the word and the things were happening. Be healed and the person starts walking. It is convicting power. When Stephen preached the word of God, the Bible says in Acts chapter 7 verse 54 that when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. It is converting power. We all know we are saved by the grace through faith. Romans 10 verse 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So when you hear the word of God, always be in a position so that you hear the word of God by reading the word of God, by hearing from preachers. You get the relation with God. It is cleansing power. Jesus said in John 15 verse 3, You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. It has conquering power. Did you know that when the Lord Jesus came back and faced the devil, all of his demons and the armies of this world, he is only going to have one weapon. And that is Revelation 19 verse 15. It says, Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it should strike the nations. That sword is the sword of the Lord, the word of God. That is what we have. It is it's definite in its object. It's definite. It is definite in its object. The Bible here is compared to a sword. This sword is used by the Holy Spirit to accomplish four objectives. It explores the soul. First one, it explores the soul. So the word is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit and of joints and marrow. So the great physician is like a skilled surgeon with a sharp scalpel. He can take the sword and cut you deeper than any human knife can do. It can cut deeper. So the smallest cutting device ever made by human are glass micropytide tubes used in the intercellular work on living cells. These glass knives are 65 times thinner than the human hair. Yet there is something that can cut much finer and deeper, and it is the word of God. You can feel it when you are reading the word. You can feel it when you are hearing the word of God, because it cuts deep. That's why people don't want to hear it. This word can divide soul and spirit. Now the spirit is the deepest part of man, for that is what separates men from plants and animals. Plants have a body, animals have a body, and a soul. But only man has a body, a soul, and a spirit. And the word of God can penetrate to the deepest level and divide that soul from the spirit. So it can show you instantaneously that you may be emotionally alive in your soul, intellectually alive in your mind, but totally dead in your spirit. It can tell you. So it examines the spirit. The word of God is a discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In other words, this book cannot tell you what you do. It can tell you why you do it. You see, the Bible not only gets under your skin, it can get into your heart. You can, you, you can tell it because you live by the word. So the word descend there is the Greek word kritios, which gives our English word critique. So the Bible is a critique. I get amused at those so-called theologians who have declared themselves critics of the Bible. Now I have only one thing to say about these scholars and their methodology. You don't criticize the Bible. The Bible criticizes you. 
Who am I to criticize the Bible? All I am to do is to study it, believe it, and preach it as the inerrant word of God. No error in it. And there is no creature hidden from his side, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Verse 18. So God penetrates our hearts and with his word lays open before his eyes. So the word open literally means put a knife to the throat. So the, this word was used for criminals who being led to trial or execution. Often a soldier would hold the point of a, a dag under the criminal's chin to force him to hold his head high so you would have to look into the gaze of the judge instead of dropping his head. Likewise, the Bible is a sword that causes us to look to God square in the eyes and face the reality of what we really are. That is what the Bible is. It expels sin. This is the book that can expel sins. It expels sins. You know, one thing, you know, this book can expel you from sin. Or a sin can expel you from this book. That's one thing that happens. There's one gigantic difference between a spiritual word and a physical word. Sword. A physical sword cuts living people to make them dead. But these spiritual swords cuts dead people to make them alive. Friend, God's word is not only able to divide and descend. It is also able to deliver you. It's able to deliver you. This is not a heart so hard that the sword of the spirit cannot pierce that heart and penetrate that heart. And bring that heart to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I was reading the story of George Whitefield. The great 18th century evangelist was hounded by a group of distractors who called themselves the Hellfire Club. They mocked him, they laughed at him, and they derided his way. They made fun of his preaching. On one occasion, one of their ringleaders, a young man named Thorpe, was mimicking Whitefield, making fun of him. He was actually delivering one of his sermons with brilliant accuracy, perfectly imitating his tone and his facial expressions. They were laughing, having a wonderful time. Then all of a sudden, a strange thing happened. As this young man Thorpe was preaching Whitefield's sermon, his lips began to quiver. His eyes began to water. The color drained out of his eyes, of his face. His friends didn't know what was going on. They thought he was getting ill. But in reality, he was getting well. Because all of a sudden, he sat down on the ground and cried out to God and asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save him. This man Thorpe went on to become a prominent Christian leader in the city of Bristol. Isn't that great? So the sword of the Lord is indeed sharp, living and powerful. The power of God's sword is powerful, it's living. It can cut for you the bread you like. It is a two-edged sword. It can cut you and kill you. It can cut you and heal you. The choice is up to you. The choice is up to you. I, I know there are secrets in your heart that you have kept. But one thing, let me tell you. Who really knows your secrets? Who really knows you? Maybe you think your best friend knows the real you. But does the real person, this person, know how jealous you are of his or her talents? your career or good looks? Does he or she hear you bickering and you put downs that try to equalize your popularity with his or hers? Does your friend know those things? That is what you are trying to do behind his or her back. Maybe your spouse knows you, but does, does your spouse know all about your past, your moral weakness, your caving into crowd pressure? Can he or she read your thoughts all about the other handsome men or pretty women who cross your path and divert your fans? Maybe no human knows you that well. But God does. God's ways of talking to you about your secret thoughts, helping you confront them is his word, the Bible. It is only this book which knows about your secret thoughts. The Bible opened to you through the word of the Holy Spirit is your clearest mirror and strongest counselor. Read the Bible and see for yourself. Start the Bible and learn about yourself and God. Apply the Bible and it will change your life.
your life will never be the same. Nothing can be hidden from God. He knows about everyone, everywhere. And everything about us is wide open to his all-seeing eyes. God sees all we do and knows all we think. Even when we are in our way of his presence, he's there. When we try to hide from him, he sees us. We can have no secrets from God. Can your Christian life stand the test? Is your faith living or real? May the good Lord help you as you contemplate upon these words. As now you think to say, which book would you read more? This is the book I recommend for you to read it on daily basis. Go back to it. Read this book. It has got powerful words. It is the word of God that can change your life. And your life will never be the same. May God bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Let us pray. Thank you, Father. Father for the living. Powerful word of God. I pray that whatever it takes, your Holy Spirit would continue to convict, convert, comfort, and conform us into the image of the lovely Lord Jesus so that we become the persons you want us to be. May we never hinder the work of your Holy Spirit within us as he continues to divide us, our born-again spirit, from our sin-sick soul. Root out all that is not of Christ and use us as we pray, as conscious through whom you can flow, unhindered into the lives of those around us. Thank you that you loved us so much that you proposed to change all who believe into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Brothers, I just want to urge you that uh, it's time for our offering. We need to thank God. Why should I thank God? I want to thank God for his word. If it wasn't for this word, maybe I would have died long back ago. Died in my own sins. But this book changed my life. And I want to thank God for that. Maybe it has changed your life too. Will you not take time to thank God as we give our thanksgiving offering? It's a way of saying thank you God because without your word I will not be what I am today. Thank you Lord. Let us pray for our offerings. Heavenly Father, we bring our thanksgiving offering. We thank you that through your word you have taught us to come back and say thank you. So we just want to say thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for giving us this book, which has changed a lot of people's lives. So many people, we have gone through different levels in their lives have been changed by this book. Thank you, Father. Thank you. May you continue to bless us. Bless these offerings, Lord, so that they can be used in your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us receive grace. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you, Lord. You have grace on my brothers and sisters in Christ. Have mercy for the lost and dying well, which needs to acknowledge Jesus as their kinsman redeemer. Ye and answer our prayer, Father. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you.